Let's pray. Our beloved Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to be in your presence once again. As we speak today about keeping the commandments of God, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We realize that there are many in this world, people who claim the name of Jesus, even, who believe that it's not necessary to keep the Ten Commandments or that they were nailed to the cross. I ask, Lord, that you will help us understand this very important subject and that we might understand that you will have a people in the end time who keep the commandments of God. We thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The expression, keep the commandments of God, appears three times in the book of Revelation. It appears in Revelation 12, 17, Revelation 14, 12, and Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14. I'd like to begin by reading the reference from Revelation 14, 12, and then we'll read 22, 14, and then we'll take a closer look at Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 14, verse 12, comes immediately after the third angel's message. The third angel's message says, Beware of worshiping the beast, his image, or receiving his mark. And then in the very next verse, Revelation 14, verse 12, we find these words. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So you'll notice that those who keep the commandments of God are in contrast to those who worship the beast and his image and receive the mark. Because Revelation 14, verse 11 speaks about those who worship the beast, his image, and receive the mark. Revelation 14, verse 12, in contrast, speaks about those who keep the commandments of God and have the patience of the saints. The second reference that I would like to read is Revelation 22 and verse 14. There is a problem of translation here. Uh, some versions read, Blessed are those who wash their robes. However, I believe, and I can't get into all of the reasons right now, I believe that the best translation is the one that I'm going to read now. Revelation 22 and verse 14. Blessed are those who do His commandments. Other versions say, wash their robes. But I believe this is the correct translation. Blessed are those who do His commandments. It's the same expression, keep the commandments. I don't know why the uh, New King James uses do instead of keep, but it's the same identical expression. That they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. You'll notice here that we're not told that there's a group of people who believe in the commandments. It doesn't say that there's a group of people who have the commandments or who teach the commandments or who preach the commandments. We're told explicitly in Revelation 14, 12 and Revelation 22, 14 that there will be a group of people who keep the commandments of God. So I guess that if anybody teaches you that no one can keep the commandments, they're lying. And not only are they lying, but they're making God a liar. Because God says that there will be a people who keep the commandments of God. Those are God's words. And if any minister gets up or any priest gets up and says, no, nah, the commandments, Jesus kept them. They were for the Jews. They were nailed to the cross. Nobody can keep them. Beware, because God says that he will have a people who keep the commandments of God. Now, the third reference where this expression, keep the commandments of God, is found is Revelation 12 and verse 17. I want us to take a closer look at this specific reference. It says there in Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman. Who's the dragon? Revelation 12, verse 9, uh, earlier in the chapter, says that the dragon represents Satan. And so... Satan was enraged with the woman. What does the woman represent? The church, that's right. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. I like the better the way the King James says, went to make war with the remnant of her seed. 
Now what characteristics do they have? Who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Once again, is God going to have a people who keep the commandments of God? Absolutely. This text is explicit. This text is clear. God will have a remnant that keep the commandments of God. Is the devil going to hate these people because they keep the commandments of God? This verse says that the devil hates those who keep the commandments of God, which means that he must also hate the commandments of God. Now, in order to understand Satan's hatred for the Ten Commandments, we need to go back to the origin of sin in the universe. And so we're going to pay a visit to heaven before sin entered this world. In fact, before this world was even created. You see, in heaven there was a covering cherub whose name was Lucifer. And the Bible tells us that he was in the very presence of God. Notice Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 14. Ezekiel 28 verse 14 speaks about the function of this being. It says there, you were the anointed cherub who covers. Now don't forget that, the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. The fiery stones represent angels. So we have here a, an anointed cherub who covers. Now what does that mean, an anointed cherub who covers? Covers what? Well, in Exodus 25, verses 17 to 20, we have a description of the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary, and specifically of the Ark of the Covenant. And by the way, the earthly sanctuary was a shadow of the real sanctuary in heaven. So if there's an ark on earth with the Ten Commandments inside, there must also be the originals in heaven. Notice what Exodus 25, verse 17 through 20 has to say about uh, the angels that were placed on the Ark of the Covenant. God says to Moses, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width and you shall make two cherubim of gold. See, there you have the cherubim. Of hammered work, you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. In other words, they were at either end of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it, of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim, notice this, shall what? Stretched out their wings above, doing what? Covering the mercy seat with their wings. And they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. So you have cherubim and they cover. What did they cover? They covered the mercy seat, which represented the very throne of God. Now, do you know what was inside the Ark of the Covenant? below that which represented the throne of God? Do you know what was the foundation of God's government? The foundation of any government is its laws. I want you to notice that after that ark had been made, God instructed Moses to take the Ten Commandments and place them inside the ark. This is the earthly sanctuary, but the earthly is a shadow of the heavenly. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 4, and we'll also read verse 5. Uh, Deuteronomy 10, verses 4 and 5. Speaking about God, it says, And He wrote, that is, God wrote, on the tablets, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me, says Moses. Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I made. And there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. So where was this majestic being, Lucifer? He was in the very presence of God. He was next to the Ark of the Covenant. His wings covered the mercy seat, and below the mercy seat was the holy law of God, just like in the earthly sanctuary. The Bible tells us that at some point, this majestic being chose that he would rebel against the law of God. Notice Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 16, and this verse you will find here on your list, Ezekiel 28 and verse 16. We're told there, 
speaking about Lucifer, by the abundance of your trading, we'll talk about it, that in a few moments, you became filled with violence within. And you what? That's important. And you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. So we find here, according to this passage, that this majestic being sinned. Now the question is, what is sin? Well, before we answer that question, let's emphasize with another verse this same point that the devil sinned at the very beginning. Notice 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. Explicitly, the Bible tells us that the devil sinned not from Mount Sinai on, because some people think that the law started at Mount Sinai with Moses. No, sin originated in heaven before this world was even created. And so it says in 1 John 3 verse 8, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from Mount Sinai. That's not what it says, right? The devil has sinned from when? From the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. But you say, Pastor Bohr, what is sin? You say, okay, it says in Ezekiel and it says in 1 John that the devil sinned in heaven, Lucifer sinned and he became the devil. Uh, what is sin? Notice 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. 1 John 3 and verse 4. It says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. I like the way the King James expresses it. Sin is the transgression of the law. In other words, sin is breaking God's holy law. So let me ask you something. Did the law have to exist in heaven in order for Lucifer to sin? I mean, all you have to do is add 2 plus 2 equals 4. I mean, if he sinned, there must have been a law because sin is transgression of the law. But you know, he didn't sin by himself. In fact, the Bible says that he started bad-mouthing God. He started talking to the angels and saying, you know, God's laws are unjust. We're uh, very developed beings. We don't need any law to govern us. In fact, notice Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 16 once again. It says there, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Now, what does that word trading mean? By the abundance of your trading, you were filled with violence and you sin violence within and you sinned. Well, we need to look at some other verses that use that same root Hebrew word. So let's look at a couple of statements in the Old Testament that use the same root as that word trading that is found in Ezekiel 28, verse 16. Go with me a little earlier in Ezekiel to chapter 22 and verse 9. Ezekiel 22 and verse 9. Remember, this is the same root word. And it says there, In you are men who what? who slander, that's the same root word, by the way, who slander to cause bloodshed. In you are those who eat on the mountains. In your midst they commit lewdness. So notice, God says, in you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. That word slander is the same root word that is used for trading in Ezekiel 28 and verse 16. Notice another verse that uses the same root word. Leviticus 19 and verse 16. Leviticus 19, verse 16. It says there, You shall not go about as a talebearer. Interesting. The same root word. How is it translated? Talebearer. You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. And so what did Lucifer do? It says that he began trading. He began to slander. He began telling tales, if you please. In fact, Jesus alluded to this in John 8, verse 44. If you go with me, John 8, verse 44. Jesus is speaking to the Jews who want to kill him. And he says, you are of your father the devil. 
and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. What is the devil? A liar. From when is he a liar? He is a liar from when? From the beginning, according to this text. Now you say, but pastor, what does trading have to do uh, with tail-bearing and with slander and with lying? Well, you know, we still use in uh, modern English certain idiomatic expressions that show uh, the meaning of this word. Uh, you know, if somebody tells you something and you don't believe it, we often say, I don't buy that. Don't we say it? I don't buy that. Or you can't sell me that one, we say, because it's trying to trade in what? In lies. Now the question is, how, who did the devil lie to? The fact is that the book of Revelation tells us who he lied to. Go with me to Revelation 12 and verse 3. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3. It's speaking about the dragon who represents Satan. It says his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. What was it that threw the stars to the earth? His what? His tail. You say, now that's kind of strange. What do the stars represent? The stars, we're going to notice, represent angels. But why with the tail? The Bible has the explanation. Go with me to Isaiah 9, verses 15 and 16. Isaiah 9, verses 15 and 16. It says, the elder and honorable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches lies, he is what? The tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. So what does the tail represent? The tail represents lies, according to Scripture. Now, how many of the angels was he successful in lying to and recruiting? The Bible says a third, Revelation 12 and verse 9. Revelation 12 and verse 9. It says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. You know, there's a couple of books that uh, I have alluded to before, and I'd like to read just a couple of statements from these two books. One of them is the book Patriarchs and Prophets, which tells basically the history of uh, the world from the inception of sin all the way till the time of the Hebrew monarchy. And uh, here we have a reference to what happened in heaven. I want you to listen carefully. This is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 37. Speaking about Lucifer, it says, Leaving his place in the immediate presence of the Father, Lucifer went forth to diffuse the spirit of discontent among the angels. He worked with mysterious secrecy and for a time concealed his real purpose under an appearance of reverence for God. Is that the way the Antichrist is going to do at the end? Under the appearance of God? He's going to do exactly the same thing because the Antichrist is the emissary of the devil. Now notice what, it, what she continues saying. He began to insinuate doubts concerning the laws that governed heavenly beings, intimating that though laws might be necessary for the inhabitants of the worlds, angels, being more exalted, needed no such restraint, for their own wisdom was a sufficient guide. In other words, angels don't need laws and restrictions. They should know through their own wisdom what's right and what's wrong. Their heart will tell them what's right. In another statement in that classic book on Bible prophecy, the Great Controversy, page 499, we find this very significant statement. Speaking about Lucifer, he reiterated his claim that angels needed no control, but should be left to follow their own will, which would ever guide them right. In other words, the source of ethics would be where? From outside or from inside? From inside. That's important. Don't forget it. Now notice, he denounced the divine statutes, that is the law of God, as a restriction of their liberty 
and declared that it was his purpose to secure the abolition of law. What did he want to do? He wanted to get rid of the law. Beware of any minister who wants to get rid of the law of God by saying that it was nailed to the cross or it was for the Jews or Jesus kept it so that I don't have to keep it. Beware of that because that's what Lucifer said in heaven. And so he said, he denounced the divine statutes as a restriction of their liberty and declared that it was his purpose to secure the abolition of law, that freed from this restraint, the hosts of heaven might enter upon a more exalted, more glorious state of existence. Do you know that the devil used the same temptation on Eve? Go with me to Genesis chapter 3, and you're going to see that what this author, what Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets in Great Controversy is corroborated by Scripture, by all of the texts that we already read, plus what we're going to notice from Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, or as it says in the New International Version, Has God really said... That's what it means. Has God really said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What is he taking issue with? With what God said. He's taking issue with God's word. And he's saying, did God really say this? And of course, he knows that, that uh, Eve is going to respond. Because God did not say they could not eat from every tree of the garden, but from one. And so he's trying to find Eve to respond. And notice what it says in verse uh, Two, and the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said. Do you have a controversy here between two words, the word of God and the word of the serpent? That's where the issue is. Is that going to be the issue at the end of time also? Absolutely. And so notice. Once again, verse 3, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Let me ask you, when the devil said that to Eve, what was the immediate thought that came to her mind? I'll tell you what came to her mind, because the devil plants thoughts because he knows what we're going to think in reaction to the thought that he planted. God said, if you eat from the tree, the day you eat, you're going to die. Now the serpent says, you're not going to die. So the first thought that comes to Eve's mind is, then why did God say we were going to die? If we're not going to die, why did God say that we were going to die if we ate from the tree? And the devil planted that, that question in her mind, and immediately he tries to answer it. Notice verse 5. For God knows. Now he says, you want to really know? It's not because you're going to die. You know what God really has in mind? Notice. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. God wants you to be what? If their eyes need to be open, it's because they're what? They're blind. God wants you to be blind. He wants blind obedience. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. Eyes represent wisdom. In other words, you'll have wisdom, you have knowledge beyond what God wants you to know. Now, what didn't God want them to know? Notice what it continues saying. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God in a certain sense. Notice, you will be like God. How? knowing good and evil. Who is it that defines good and evil, folks? God defines what is good and what is evil, right? And what specifically is written that defines good and evil? It's His law. Is it a law outside of man? Or is a law inside man? It's actually an objective law outside of man. In other words, God lays down the rules. But what is the devil saying? The devil is saying, the day that you eat of the tree, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, you're not going to need God to define what is good and evil. You're, you yourself will be able to define what is good and what is evil without God telling you what it is. By the way, this was the first postmodern argument in human history. 
the idea that you can be your own source of ethics. Is that exactly what happened to Lucifer in heaven, according to what we read in Patriarchs and Prophets and also in the Great Controversy? The identical thing. You can be your own source of decisions, your own source of ethics. Truth is relative. Right and wrong is just a matter of opinion. And that's what the world is teaching today. But now the question is, can we be sure the, that the expression, keep the commandments in these verses in Revelation, refer to keeping the Ten Commandments? Well, I want to go to several passages from Scripture to show that the expression, keep the commandments, keep the commandments of God, refers to the Ten Commandments. Notice Matthew 19 and verses 17 to 22. Matthew 19, 17 to 22, because some people just generalize Revelation 12, 17. They say, well, you know, God commands us, for example, to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. That's one of the commandments. That is not the commandments that are being spoke of, spoken of in Revelation. The expression, keep the commandments of God, or keep the law of God, refers to the Ten Commandments. Notice Matthew 19, verse 17. This is the story of the rich young ruler. So he said to him, God, uh, Jesus says to this rich young ruler, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Is that the same expression we find in Revelation? Absolutely, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? What did Jesus mean when he spoke about keeping the commandments? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let me ask you, are those part of the Ten Commandments? They most certainly are. So what does the expression, keep the commandments, mean? It means to keep the Ten Commandments. And then notice verse 20. The young man said to him, all these things I have what? There's the word again. I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? And we're going to come back to this story in our next subject, because we're going to notice that he really wasn't keeping the Ten Commandments. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So what does the expression, keep the commandments, refer to in this story? It refers to keeping the Ten Commandments. Commandments. By the way, the word commandment is used many times in the New Testament to refer to specific commandments from the Ten Commandments. Notice Luke 23 and verse 56. It's speaking about the women who, uh, you know, prepare the spices and then they do something because the sun is setting. Luke 23 and verse 56. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Notice Mark 7, 9 and 10. By the way, that's the fourth commandment. That's the commandment that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now we're going to notice a passage where it speaks about uh, the fifth commandment. Mark 7, 9 and 10. He said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God. Interesting. Same expression. Keep the commandments of God. Here it says, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep Notice, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep instead of the commandments, what? Your tradition. Now, which commandment is he referring to? For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. Is that one of the Ten Commandments? Most certainly. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. So the commandment of God here, and the word keeping, refers to the Ten Commandments. Notice Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 12. Here's another commandment. This is the commandment that says, Thou shalt not covet, number 10. It says in Romans 7, verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. Is this law that uh, Paul is speaking about, the Ten Commandments? Of course, he's quoting, Thou shalt not covet. Now notice verse 8. But sin... Taking opportunity by what? By the commandment. Produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. 
I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Does the Apostle Paul use the word law and commandment to refer to the commandment that says thou shalt not covet? He most certainly does. Notice James chapter 2 and verses 10 through 12. You won't have this verse on your list. I added, a, added it afterwards. James 2 verses 10 and 11. Listen to, carefully to what it says. For whoever shall keep the whole law, that's a parallel expression, keep the commandments, keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Now what law is Paul talking about here when he says keep, the, or James, when he says keep the whole law? For he, he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not what? Do not murder. Are those two of the Ten Commandments? Most certainly. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you have become a transgressor of what? Of the law. So what does it mean to keep the law or to keep the commandments? It means to keep the Ten Commandments according to the New Testament. Now somebody might say, well, Pastor Bohr, but are the words law and commandments used interchangeably in the New Testament? And I'm make, trying to make a point here. We're going to come to something very important. And what I want to show you is that in the New Testament, the word law and the word commandment or commandments are used interchangeably. Notice Exodus 16 and verse 28. Exodus 16 and verse 28. It says here, And the Lord said to Moses, this is speaking about the manna episode where God wanted to teach the observance of the Sabbath. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my, what? Commandments and my laws. Notice Exodus 24 and verse 12. Exodus 24 and verse 12. Once again, interchangeable commandments and law. It says in verse 12, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law, and what? And commandments which I have written. What was the only thing in the Bible that God wrote Himself? It was the Ten Commandments. So are the words law and commandments used synonymously in this verse? Yes, it says, and I will give you tablets of stone, and the law, and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. In fact, we find in Deuteronomy 4, verse 13, that God gave the Ten Commandments. Notice what it says there. So He declared to you His covenant, which He commanded you to perform. And the covenant, it says, the Ten Commandments, and He wrote them on two tablets of stone. So it says here that God wrote the Ten Commandments with His own finger on tables of stone. But I want you to notice that Deuteronomy 33, verse 2, says that God didn't give the Ten Commandments, although He did, but it says rather He gave a fiery law. So commandments and law are interchangeable. Notice Deuteronomy 33 and verse 2. The Lord came from Sinai, and God dawned on them from Seir. He shone from Mount Paran, and He came with 10,000 of His saints. From His right hand came a fiery law for them. So does the Old Testament use the word law and the word commandments interchangeably? Absolutely. The New Testament does also. Notice Romans 7, verses 7 through 12. This might all appear to be academic, but I'm going to make a very important point in a few moments. Romans 7, verses 7 through 12. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? There you have the word law. Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness. Is that one of the Ten Commandments? Certainly, I would not have known covetousness unless what? The law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the... Oh, now it's the word commandment. Taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the 
law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Is the word commandment and is the word law used synonymously in the Old and New Testaments? Absolutely. Notice Romans 13 and verses 8 through 10. Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Here the Apostle Paul says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, see, has fulfilled the law, and what is in the law? The commandments. For the commandments, you should not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no, no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So are the words law and commandments used interchangeably in the New Testament? Absolutely. Now the question is, how did Jesus consider the Ten Commandments? Did Jesus believe that he was going to do away with the Ten Commandments when he died on the cross? Did he believe that Christians have no need to keep the Ten Commandments? Absolutely not. Notice John 14, verse 15. John 14, verse 15. Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 15, and verse 10. Jesus says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So what do we need to do in order to abide in His love? Keep the commandments, it says here. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His, His love. In fact, in 1 John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, he who is closest to Jesus, has some very interesting things to say about keeping the commandments. 1 John chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4. Now by this we know that we know Him. If we what? How do we know that we know Him? If we what? If we keep His commandments, He who says, says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a what? Is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. So if He's a liar, who is He following after? Satan, because the devil is a liar from the beginning. So if you have someone who tells you, oh, you can't keep the Ten Commandments, God doesn't expect you to keep the Ten Commandments, they were nailed to the cross. They're impossible to keep because the flesh is weak. Any of those excuses that are given are making God a liar. Because here it clearly says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. 1 John 5 and verse 3, 1 John 5 verse 3, for this is the love of God that we what? That we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Some people say, oh, the law, that was a yoke of bondage. Nobody can bear it, but we as Christians are free. The fact is that uh, 1 John says that if we love God, we will keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, I want to tell you why I used the verses that speak of the interchangeability of the word law and the word commandments. You see, in Bible prophecy, listen to what I'm going to say. The little horn and the man of sin of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, explicitly the Bible says that they would attempt to tamper with God's holy law. I want you to notice that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 3 through 8, the little horn, which represents the papacy, despises the law of God. Because the law of God was changed. You say, well, you know, they say we're supposed to keep the law of God. Yes, but they changed the law of God. And that's the reason why this man of sin, who appears in the temple of God, which is the church, I want you to notice what he's called. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, that is the day of the coming of Jesus, will not come unless the falling away comes first. That is the apostasy. And the man of sin, what is, what is sin according to what the Bible says? Sin is transgression of the law. So this is a man who is characterized by what? By transgression of the law. 
the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, which we've already discussed was the Roman Empire, that he may be revealed in his own time. And now notice this. For the mystery of what? Lawlessness. Does this man of sin have anything to do with lawlessness? Absolutely. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, that is the Roman Empire, will do so until he is taken out of the way. And by the way, the Roman Empire was taken away to give place to the Roman Catholic papacy. And then it says, and then the what? The lawless one. See, the Antichrist is characterized by being opposed to what? By being opposed to the law of God. And so it says, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Notice what the Bible says about the little horn. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. Speaking about the same as the man of sin, all theologians are agreed that the little horn, the man of sin, and the beast represent the same power. I want you to notice what it says about the little horn. Once again, the idea of tampering with God's holy law. It says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and what? And law. Then the saints shall be given into His hand for a time and times and half a time. For how long was this little horn going to carry on his work of attempting to change the times and the law? For time, times, and the dividing of time, which, by the way, is 1,260 years. Now I'm going to tell you why I use those verses to speak about the interchangeability of the word commandments and the word law. Go with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13. Revelation chapter 12, and we'll read only through verse 14, and then we'll jump to verse 17. It says in verse uh, 13, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Who did the little horn persecute? The saints, right? Here it says that the dragon persecutes whom? The woman. So the woman is what? The saints, or the church. And so it says, He persecuted the woman who gave, gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Is that the same period that the little horn ruled? Absolutely. Now let me ask you, do you think that at the end of this period, God was going to raise up a people to correct the intended change in God's holy law? Absolutely. Immediately, I want you to notice that Daniel 7.25 speaks about the little horn thinking or intending to change God's law for time, times, and the dividing of time. Now we're going to notice immediately after speaking about the woman fleeing to the wilderness for the same time period, at the end of that time period, God raises up a remnant. And what characterizes that remnant? They do the opposite of what the little horn wanted to do. The little horn wanted to change God's law, but what does the remnant do after the 1260 years? Notice verse 17. Very clearly it says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, who what? Who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Is that the antidote, antidote to the intended change in God's law? Yes. See, the little horn thought that he could change God's law, but at the end of that period of the time, times, and the dividing of time, God raises up a remnant of people who keep the commandments of God, a group of people that do not accept this change in the law. And as I mentioned at the beginning of our study, you remember that uh, the expression, keep the commandments of God, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, is in antithesis to worshiping the beast, his image, and receiving his mark. In other words, those who worship the beast, his image, and receive the mark are in opposition to those who keep the commandments of God. Now, I want to show you 
another couple of verses from Revelation that speak about keeping the commandments of God. We read them at the beginning of our study. Revelation 22, verses 14 and 15. Revelation 22, 14 and 15. You know, some of you might be thinking, well, Pastor Bohr, you know, what you're preaching is really legalistic. Keeping the commandments, keeping the commandments. Well, folks, take heart. In our next lecture, we're going to talk about faith in Jesus. We're going to talk about the other side of the coin. We're going to talk about how we receive the power to keep the Ten Commandments. But for this evening, we're studying what it means to keep the commandments of God. Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who do His commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life. Who are the ones who have a right to the tree of life? What does God say? Not Pastor Bohr. The Bible says, Blessed are those who do or keep His commandments, the same word, who keep His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Is keeping the commandments a prerequisite for eating of the tree of life and entering the gates to the holy city? Absolutely. And some people say, you're annulling God's grace. No, we aren't. Just don't miss the next lecture because we're going to balance this with the grace of God and what faith means in Scripture. Now, I want you to notice uh, the following verse. I'm going to show you that those who are in the city keep the commandments, whereas those who are outside the city disobey the Ten Commandments. It says there in verse 15, but outside. Now, it's inside our commandment keepers, those who kept the commandments. It says, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Are those all violations of the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. Inside are commandment keepers, and outside are those who insisted on being commandment breakers. Notice also Revelation chapter 21 and verses 7 and 8. Once again, the contrast between those inside and those outside. It says in Revelation 21 and verse 7, He who overcomes, that's a key word, He who overcomes, shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now, who are the overcomers? What did they overcome? Notice verse 8. But, see the contrast? Those inside overcame. Those outside, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Is the contrast clear? Crystal clear that those who are inside kept God's commandments, those outside refused to keep God's commandments and continued committing their sins. Now I'd like to end this study today by saying that what we're discussing is not legalism. In other words, we're not saying here that we keep the commandments of God in order to be saved. We're talking about keeping the commandments out of love for Jesus Christ. I want you to notice Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1 speaks about the end time generation. It speaks about those who follow the Lamb wherever the Lamb goes, those who have no lie in their mouth, those who are without spot before the throne of God. Notice they had a special characteristic. Revelation 14 and verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written where? In their foreheads. What is written in the foreheads of that end time generation who keep the commandments of God? The name of God. Now the question is, what does the name represent in Scripture? I want to read you a statement from the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, volume 3, pages 500 and 501. In biblical thought, a name is not a mere label of identification. It is an expression of the essential nature of its bearer. In other words, your name indicates who you are. A man's name reveals his character, says this uh, Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible. Adam was able to give names to the beasts and birds 
because, as Milton says, he understood their nature. In other words, Adam was able to understand the character of the beast, therefore he was able to name them. In fact, in the Bible, the name stands for the character. Let me give you a couple of verses to illustrate that point. Genesis 27 and verse 36. Genesis 27 and verse 36. This is the story of Jacob and Esau. And Esau said, speaking about his brother, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has... Jacob means supplanter, by the way. For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now look, he has taken away my blessing. In other words, he is rightly named. He is the supplanter. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 25 and verse 25. 1 Samuel 25 and verse 25. This is speaking about Naboth, which the, the name, or Nabal rather, the name Nabal means uh, fool. And so it says, please, let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. In other words, he's rightly named fool. In other words, his name indicates his what? His character. The name represents the character. And by the way, where is the character of God revealed? Where is the character of God described in written form? The character of God is described in written form in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments show what God is like. And by the way, this is the reason why in the Bible, time after time after time, sin is against God. Breaking the commandments is actually sinning against a person, against God. The prodigal son says, I have sinned against heaven and against you and I'm not worthy to, be, worthy to be called your son. And you remember that David said against you, only you have I what? Have I sinned. So when we break the Ten Commandments, we're sinning against the law because the law is a reflection of what? Is a reflection of the Ten Commandments. Notice Exodus 33, verses 18 and 19. Exodus 33, verses 18 and 19. Here Moses is on the mountain, and he asks God, please, show me your glory. Then he said, what was the glory that God showed him? I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim what? The name of the Lord before you. God's goodness is his name. It's his character. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. You see, folks, when the Bible says that this end time generation is going to have the name of God on their foreheads, that means that they're going to have God's character, and God's character is reflected in His what? Is reflected in His law. They're going to, going to have the law of God not on tables of stone, but they're going to have the law written on the tables of their hearts. They're going to have the law written in their minds. Now listen up. It doesn't do any good to post the Ten Commandments in courtrooms if they're not engraved in the heart. Because righteousness comes from inside out. It does not come from outside in. It does no good to legislate morality because you don't change someone from outside. In order to make a lump of dough grow, you have to put the leaven inside and then the dough grows. You know, I find it interesting that this week in Newsweek, there's an article that says that there's less and less Christianity in this country, in the United States of America. And this has caused an uproar among conservative Christians. They say, what do you mean this isn't a Christian nation? This is a Christian nation. You think so? By looking out there, it sure wouldn't appear like it. Christians eat what others eat. They listen to what others listen to. They watch television and movies that everybody else watches. They get divorced on the same level as others. They're filled with greed and accumulating possessions for themselves. They dress like the world. Everything they do is like the world. So how is it that we say that we're a Christian nation when really the United States reflects just the opposite and people who are unbelievers, they look at us and say, hey, if that's Christianity, I don't want anything to do with Christianity. The fact is that if the churches preach the law of God, the need to have a conversion experience 
and to have God write His law on our minds and in our hearts, you wouldn't have all of the social problems that we have in the world today. In fact, allow me to read you a statement in Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. Psalm 40, 6 through 8. After saying that God has loved righteousness and He has hated iniquity, notice what is it that, it, that instills that hate in the heart. It says in Psalm 40, verse 6, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. By the way, this is Jesus speaking messianically a thousand years before He was born. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of your book it is written of me. I delight to what? I delight to do your will. Why did He delight to do God's will? I delight to do your will, O oh my God. And your law is written where? Within my heart. Did Jesus need all kinds of external laws to keep him in line? No, because he had the law of God written where? In his heart. And God will have a group of people in the end time who have the name of God written in their forehead. They will have God's character, and God's character is written in the Ten Commandments, in God's law, and the Bible says that they will keep the commandments of God, including the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. When the beast and his image are imposing the mark upon the world, God's people will say like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, no way, we obey the God of heaven. We keep his holy Sabbath and we're willing to die in order to be loyal to God. That's what God's people are going to be like in the end time. They will serve God because they love God with all of their hearts, because the law of God is written upon their minds and their hearts. And I pray to God that that will be our experience, that God will write His law on our hearts.